Hey, Roger, what should I be doing now to set myself up to rock retirement within the next five years? I get that question all the time, so I decided to make a free guide to give you actions you can take to set yourself up to rock retirement. And you can check it out at doretirementright.com. Do you want to have the confidence to truly rock retirement? Well, I'm going to show you how on the Retirement Answer Man Show. Well, hey there. Welcome to the show. My name is Roger Whitney. I am your host. I'm excited that you're here. And if you're new to the show, because the show has grown a lot this year, I'm always amazed. Welcome to the show. The show's about you and helping you think intentionally about how do you actually rock retirement. Hopefully, this show is going to help you fill the gap between the articles you read and the software you may use and actually making decisions. We want you to make a lot of little decisions using an agile methodology, hence agile retirement management, to iterate to rocking retirement, which is essentially how you create a great life, right? Is iteration. I was thinking about that today because I heard a phrase from Brian Johnson. He has a platform called Optimize.me, I believe. If you look up Brian Johnson, Optimize, you'll get it. And he just made it completely free. And he talked about playing the ultimate game. And we forget what the ultimate game is living day to day. What is the ultimate game? Well, the way we talk about it is rocking retirement. This period of life, if you're in your 50s, where you're getting ready to leave full-time work and you have one shot of creating the kind of life that you want in this season of a lot of time freedom and hopefully a lot of resources to use. And the ultimate game isn't getting your Roth conversion right. I mean, yeah, that's important. The ultimate game is looking back at the end of life and, well, going, wow, wow. Look what that, what just happened. Look at what we did to minimize the regrets at end of life. That's the ultimate game. And it's easy to forget that. That's one reason why in our process that we like to talk about and we teach about is always making the main thing, the main thing. And that is rocking retirement. That means you have to have a feasible plan that is resilient. And then you work on optimizing it. You want to go in that order. So don't forget the ultimate game. I guess that's what I wanted to say. Now, we have Retirement Plan Live, our live case study coming up in January. And on the first day, I think we had 100 plus people submit. And so we're calling through those. So look forward to a live case study in January, which we're excited about. And the Rock Retirement Club, our online membership where we have a community and a course and tools. We closed enrollment into the club for the next month or two because we have a lot of big changes to try to make it better. So FYI on that. And I also got some feedback recently on jargon. I was getting a little bit too technical in some of my jargon. Now, technical is important when you need it. Jargon serves a purpose, but I definitely want to make sure that I don't go down the rabbit hole of using you know, inside baseball talk, things that I think about and talk about all the time from a planning perspective that you may not use these words. So I'll be careful about that. You know, it's sort of like if you talk to somebody in the military or that works for the government, they have all these acronyms and phrases that don't mean anything to me because I don't use those phrases. So I want to be careful of that. So I appreciate that feedback. So today we're going to answer some of your questions and then bring on Kevin Lyles, head of education in the Rock Retirement Club to noodle on how do you overcome frugality in retirement? So let's get to answering some of your questions. So our first question actually isn't a question, but a correction. Last week, we talked about QLAX, Qualified Longevity Annuity Contracts, and I was answering a question on those, and I misspoke on the limit that you're allowed to put from a tax-deferred account into a QLAC. For 2022, it's 135000 or 25% of your qualified account balance, whichever is less. I think I said whatever is more, and I just misspoke. So what that means is, let's assume you have $100,000 in an IRA, 
and you want to purchase a QLAC contract, an annuity contract that qualifies to help you with RMDs. Well, if you have $100,000, you can do 135 or 25% of the account, whichever is less. So you would be able to do 25,000 into a QLAC. So I wanted to make that correction. I want to also thank you for catching those things and telling me because I want to make sure I share that on the show. So our first question comes from Kenneth on Social Security and COLA question. Kenneth says, hey, Roger, really enjoy the podcast. I'm 57, fully retired from federal service. My wife, Sharon, and I are thoroughly enjoy the halftime RV lifestyle. Good for you. Your podcast has helped me better understand and communicate with my financial planner, which is awesome. Thank you. It will be a while before I can get Social Security benefits, but with the talk of Social Security COLA next year, it got me wondering how this will affect my benefit when I do qualify to receive benefits. For example, if the COLA is 3% next year, can I expect my projected benefit to increase by that same amount? Well, that's a good question, Kenneth. Let's dive into this. Unfortunately, it's not really that simple. Because prior to taking Social Security, your not yet claimed benefit is calculated using something called an average wage index series, which is based on wage growth. And this factors every year of earnings multiplied by it in order to bring them forward for current dollar amounts. Once they do that, it's your top 35-year wages that are identifiable that will go into calculating your estimated benefit. So I wouldn't just assume that whatever you read is the amount that you're going to get. I would check this every single year. And it shouldn't vary greatly. One thing, because you're young and retired, Kenneth, realize that when you look at your Social Security statement, the benefit that you'll receive at full retirement age is assuming that you are working until full retirement age. So what you might want to do, and the SSA.gov has a good detailed calculator, you can actually put in your wage history, and then what you can do is, you say you're 57, you can put zeros or whatever your wages will be between now and full retirement age, so it doesn't automatically make the assumption that you're continuing to earn. And that way you can get at least a little bit more accurate estimate on what your benefit's going to be. Now, once you do retire, then that's when whatever your benefit will be will have an adjustment based on COLA or the cost of living adjustment that the Social Security Administration uses. So as an example, if you were receiving Social Security this year, the Social Security cost of living adjustment will be 5.9% in 2022. That will be the biggest boost to Social Security beneficiaries in about 40 years. In 2021, the COLA adjustment was 1.3%. So this can vary. And I think there are a number of years where it was 0%. So this is definitely a big boost to Social Security costs. Now, you start to factor in Medicare cost adjustments and everything else. It all sort of washes out. Now, one thing I saw, and I don't know if it passed, and I didn't have time to look it up, is that in the most recent tax proposals, one of them was changing slightly the COLA adjustment for Social Security benefits. Now, I don't know if it actually passed, but essentially what it would do, it would tweak how they calculate the COLA adjustment, not in your favor, that would likely dampen it because it's factoring in swapping. So, you know, if filet mignon goes up in price rather than just track filet mignon, it would, mignon, is that how you say it? They would say, no, the person probably would, you know, buy chop steak or go down in quality. And so it has, you know, they get really fancy with this stuff. So just FYI on that. So Kenneth, the short answer is it's not factored on COLA. You want to look at the average wage index and then it's more complicated than that. I don't think you need to go down in the weeds in that. So just get your social security statement every single year and use the detailed calculator on the social security website. If you want to get even more, we'll call it precise, since you're retired, you know, well before full retirement age. Now, our next question comes from Brad on an inherited IRA that's urgent yet for 2021. Okay, Brad, well, let's get to that. I know it's urgent. We're going to answer it, but I forgot to say, if you have a question for the show, because we'll be doing more questions in each episode, 
You can go to rogerwhitney.com forward slash ask Roger and you can submit your question. You can leave a audio message. You can record it right from your computer or you can type it in like uh, Brad did. So Brad, let's get back to you, Brad. It's rogerwhitney.com forward slash ask Roger. Okay, Brad. Brad's, he said, my dad passed away in April of this year at 83 years old. Sorry about that. My sister is 59 and I'm 57 years old. Both inherited two traditional IRAs from him, 50% each. We have both opted to take the 10-year rule for dispersal of the funds. My dad had not taken his RMD for this year, 2021. My question is this, do we have to take an RMD this year for my dad's since he had not taken it this year. I have been getting conflicting advice on this. Any guidance you could give me would be much appreciated. The obvious first answer to this, Brad, is you need to talk to a tax consultant to get actual counsel. My understanding of it is that, yes, you're going to need to do a required minimum distribution for your dad that will be payable and be part of his estate. Because he was alive for part of 2021, he has that requirement to do his RMD. And although he's passed, the estate has that requirement, and that money would flow through the estate and go through probate or trust, depending on documents. Now, for you and your sister, you're correct. You don't have to do anything for the 50% of the inherited IRA that you have or your sister has for this year. You have roughly 10 years, to drain the entire inherited IRA. You can do that at the end. You can do it right away. You can do a little bit each year. That's the change that we had in terms of an inherited IRAs here in the last few years. So it used to be if you had an inherited IRA that you had to take out a required minimum distribution based on your life expectancy. But for anybody that passed away after January 1st, 2020, the rules have changed. And so you fall into this category. So you're correct on that. So hopefully that helped clear it up. So your dad is going to have to do the required minimum distribution for this year. So I would talk to your attorney and the CPA involved and get that tightened up because we're here at December 1st. You got to get this done before the end of the year, because if you don't, there's a 50% penalty on what you should have done as a required minimum distribution. You definitely want to avoid that. Now, our next question, and maybe it's more feedback, is from, who is this from? Penny. Hey, Penny. Penny has thoughts on dialing back. Penny says, hey, Nicole, Roger, just wanted to drop you a line and tell you how much I do enjoy your podcast and the info I'll get from it. Awesome, Penny. I also appreciated that you realized just how much you can do in a week and are dialing back on the podcast being twice a week and going back to once a week. I think it is honest of you and a good decision. The new format just didn't seem to click with me. And I guess I was just enjoying the old format and didn't want any changes. Lots of laughs. Keep up the great work. Well, thank you, Penny. I feel very comfortable with the decision to pivot back so quickly, by the way, so quickly, to once a week. Definitely gives me the margin to focus on hopefully doing less but higher quality stuff. When I was sharing this decision, not just with you, but with my team, because in the background, when I told them, hey, we're going to two episodes a week, there's a lot of dominoes that have to fall to make that work from a process standpoint that impacts more than me. There's the editor, there's the graphics designer, there's the writer, there's Nicole, there's our feeding service, there's website stuff. So I felt a little bad having thrown all this at them, them running around, creating the systems to make it so, and then just a few weeks in saying, hey guys, guess what? No, we're going to pivot and go back. A little embarrassing. I felt a little bad to do that to them. That's not productive for them. They understood. I think they actually like the decision and we forget about that. But here was the danger there in my mind was, because I contemplated this like, well, man, I just had everybody do all this stuff. I just committed to it publicly. I got to keep doing it. I said I would. I got to keep doing it. And there was a pull to own up to everything that you just said because of all the impact it had on everybody and the public promise, hey, we're doing this. But ultimately, I knew it wasn't the journey that was good for me. It wasn't good for my team. And I don't think it was good for you as a listener. And 
So I had to just sort of man up and tell everybody I messed up. I made a mistake and I'm recognizing it and I'm pivoting back. And I think that's something we all need to do sometimes, right? Because it's easy to continue to live a life or do something based on others' expectations that maybe you set up in the first place. So I appreciate that, Penny. I'm confident with it. And hopefully there is a lesson learned as we walk our journeys to rock retirement. All right, our next question comes from Gene. He says, he knows this is general education and not advice. You are correct, Gene. Gene says, I am 59 and will retire, who knows, in the next six to eight years. About 1.1 million in pre-tax IRAs, 100,000 in Roth, and some additional contributions going in. We owe $200,000 on our house with a loan about 2.5% interest rate and has about 25 years to go. And the house is presently worth around $700,000. So there's a lot of equity there. I financed it to make the payment as low as possible should cash flow change due to job, unexpected retirement, all those types of things. And you want flexibility. Presently paying extra against principal each month. Some advisors suggest paying off the house loan even if you pull monies out of a 401k and are taxed. I would think that the monies invested in even a 60-40 portfolio have a really high chance of earning more than the 2.5% cost of the loan. I would think we would probably be better off to keep the money invested, earn more than the 2.5% on average, and pay off the house monthly and keep the difference. We have no other debt. General thoughts? What are we not considering? Down markets for 10 years? Sure, but... (laughs) So should he take money from a 401k pre-tax account to pay off this $200,000 mortgage. So the way you go about feeling confident in your decision, Gene, or the way I would suggest anyway, is to go through the process of creating a plan of record. And I've referenced that phrase a few times on the show recently, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about what that means next year. And some people have asked for examples, and we're working to figure out how to share some of those publicly. So next week, we'll talk a little bit more in depth on the plan of record. But essentially, you want to walk through what your plan is right now without paying off the mortgage and how that looks going forward. Once you have that plan, then you can create a what-if scenario. Well, what if I took out $200,000, paid the tax on it, and paid off my mortgage? And then you would create a cash flow model that would show not having the payment. It would show the tax bill. It would show less money in the 401k, et cetera. And then you can create, you can look at the feasibility of each plan and what implications there might be for RMDs, what implication there might be for investment allocation and tax considerations and ACA subsidies, et cetera, et cetera. But you have to have your plan, your first version of your plan to create the what if. So I think that's the process you want to think through when addressing a decision like this is creating that what if scenario. Now, what are my thoughts on that? I don't think you want to frame it as I think I can earn more money in the markets. Perhaps you can, but you're right. We could have 10, 15 years of negative returns or flat returns. I do personally like to think about it from a flexibility standpoint. Two and a half percent is very inexpensive money. You get some tax deduction, which makes the true cost of money less. It allows you to let your money grow and control when you take money from 401ks. So I generally like this approach. And hopefully that low payment, I would also argue that rather than pay extra on the mortgage, I would seriously consider taking the extra that you're putting against principal and starting to build up after-tax cash. I would at least consider that so you can even have more flexibility in how you realize income between now and when you get to Social Security age. You could also throw in considering doing Roth conversions. I don't know how you're funding your lifestyle. I don't know where your income level is, but you're in that sweet period where, I guess you're retiring in six, eight years. You're not going to go wrong either direction. If you pay off the house with extra payments, not a bad option. If you choose not to and build up after tax cash, not a bad option. I don't think I would take the money from my 401k. I think that's a high hurdle. If you create a what-if scenario, 
to overcome to make that make sense for you. Personal story, probably a year and a half ago, I refinanced my house and I'm at 2.6%, I think is my interest rate. And right when I was doing that, I was deciding, do I just pay my house off? My mortgage is in roughly the same range as yours, Gene. And so I said, do I take this money and pay my mortgage off or do I refinance it? And so I chose to refinance it for 30 years at 2.6%. And my logic was it allowed me to maintain my liquidity and use those monies for other things. I'm not paying extra on my mortgage. And I will likely sell this house in the next six, seven years. All of those things together, and for me, because I'm an entrepreneur, having that liquidity was a big one because cash flows vary. I don't think I ever would have considered paying it out of my 401k. So those are my general thoughts on the topic. Now let's go to a listener question that is audio. We love those. Hello, Roger. I want to thank you and Andy Panko for letting me finally see the wisdom of Roth conversions. I just couldn't wrap my mind around the idea of prepaying tax, but now I get it. I was all psyched to do it, but I looked at my actively managed post-tax mutual fund for year-end distributions, and holy cow, did that blow my idea of Roth conversions out the window. It kind of ate my tax bracket. So I just wanted to have fellow listeners to do the same, just in case. Thank you very much for all you do. Bye-bye. Well, thanks so much for your feedback. And when you're considering doing a Roth conversion, which is sort of the season right now, there are a lot of things that you got to take into consideration. So you're exactly right that you want to look at your interest, your dividends, your capital gains distributions all other sources of income, and you really want to do a estimate of your taxes and where you're going to fall in brackets, not just for the tax brackets, but also for IRMA or ACA subsidies or Social Security taxation. If you're in that phase of life, it can impact a lot of different things. And November, December is a good time to do your estimate of what your income is going to be for the year. So you can, one, evaluate Roth conversions, like you're saying here, Steve, but also so you can evaluate, well, what actions might I take to help this situation, right? You know, are there any losses that are unrealized that I could proactively harvest to offset some of these gains? So if you have a lot of capital gains, like Steve does, if you have part of your asset allocation, let's just say emerging markets, that is at a loss, now is the time to consider selling that emerging markets position, realizing the loss, because you can offset gains. If you have a million dollars in gains and you realize a million dollars in losses, it can offset it 100%. And then one way to do that is, let's stick with this example, emerging markets position. You sell emerging market fund A and you buy some other emerging market investment option, being an ETF or a mutual fund. Now, there's some rules about being substantially equivalent, so you got to be careful about that. But you can look for ways to harvest losses. The problem right now is, for almost everybody, there aren't any losses because everything has done so well year after year. And then you have 401k contributions, HSA contributions, charitable donations, So if you're really serious about doing Roth conversions, you want to look at all these options to see if there's a way to help you manage those tax brackets. And also when it comes to Roth conversions, Steve, you really want to look at the multi-year picture of the tax discussion. I just had this discussion this morning with a client because we were evaluating doing a Roth conversion this year. And it was based on my assets, my after-tax assets, my tax deferred assets, et cetera, and my income for this year, doesn't make sense to do a Roth conversion. And one of the things that we looked at was, I always like to start with, well, if we don't do any Roth conversions, what is the projected required minimum distribution amount at age 72? Because each year you have those tax deferred assets, they just keep growing in theory, assuming the assets grow, then your tax liability will grow when you are required to make those distributions at age 72. And that's a good thing to look at 
to begin with, because then you can get an idea. What? I'm going to have to take out $200,000 when I'm 72 years old? I won't need near that much money. And at age 72, when you take out this theoretical $200,000, well, that's money that will become taxable income. And you won't have a choice. And each year after that, the way the RMD tables work, the percentage that you have to take out goes up. So if your assets are growing and the percentage goes up, you can see the pickle you find yourself in. And the thing that we don't know about the future, we don't know what the tax rates are going to be. We don't know how steep the step-ups are going to be. We don't know how IRMA or Medicare surcharges, what that scheme is going to look like. We don't know what the taxation on Social Security, what that scheme is going to look like way out into the future. And so it becomes a discussion of, well, if I do a conversion today, I know I will pay X amount. And is that X amount worth it because I've locked in my tax for this year and now I don't have to worry as much about tax brackets later in life? It is a multivariable problem that we have to deal with. But you are correct, Steve. You definitely want to factor in all these different sources because it might throw, yeah, I only made 10 grand this year, but you forgot about all these capital gains. So thanks for pointing that out. And with that, let's move on to Coach's Corner, where we're going to talk with Kevin Lyles about overcoming frugality and just have an open discussion of some things that you can think about. Mr. Lyles, how are you doing, sir? I'm doing great, Roger. Happy Thanksgiving. Yeah, it's, I, I had a great Thanksgiving. How was yours? Wonderful. Wonderful. I ate a little too much, but it was great. So a little backstory. Uh, Kevin is a rabid Ohio State fan, which I think we've probably talked about on the show. And I am a Michigan State Spartan. And he invited me to fly to Columbus a couple of weeks ago to go to the Ohio State Michigan State game. And I almost went and I am so glad that I didn't because Ohio State might have handed Michigan State the biggest defeat that in my lifetime. It wasn't watchable football, probably not even for an Ohio State fan after the end or after the first half. You're right. We Buckeyes enjoyed the game, but it wasn't the highest quality of football on both sides, probably. Yeah. So I just want to acknowledge this publicly because we give each other a lot of grief, but that's not what we're talking about today. What is the topic for today? Well, Roger, I've heard you talk in the past couple of podcasts about overcoming frugality. And as you know, we had a couple of great sessions on that topic at the Rodeo Roundup. And I just thought we would discuss what it means and sort of at least tease it out a little bit. And I've got a couple of tips for people. And it's really talking about how do you get yourself to move from an accumulation mindset where you've saved for decades and saved all you can and deprived yourself of things to the distribution phase of life in retirement when you need to spend that money. And that's the thing, because it's not about, this is where it always starts to feel a little uncomfortable because we think about it of, it's just about spending money. And that's not really what it's about. That is, if it's just about spending money, there's no soul to that, right? Absolutely. You really have to say, why did you save all that money? Why did you act frugally all those years? And really, there are two primary purposes, I think, for your money in retirement. One, it makes you feel financially secure, you know, and lets you sleep at night. And that's important. You no longer have paychecks coming in. So you need that feeling of financial security. And then two, the obvious one is to pay for the best retirement lifestyle that you can afford. And that includes things like your legacy goals or charitable goals that you have. That's what that money's for. And a lot of people, as you know, in your retirement planning, a lot of people just can't turn loose of that money that they saved up, or at least they have a hard time doing it. And so that's what I wanted to talk about is just how do you get yourself to do that? What came to mind as you were talking just now, maybe it's the season, (laughs) was the extreme of Ebenezer Scrooge. Right. Yes. That's the very extreme. So of holding on to it with no real understanding as to why, other than it feels safe. I think you're right. And you have to start with that, because if you're not comfortable with your retirement financial plan, you're never going to be comfortable spending that money because you're worried you're going to run out. That's the first question everyone asked you, right? When they come to you, do I have enough money to last the rest of my life? And so you've got to have confidence in your plan. And if you don't know 
how much you should spend or can spend, then you need to get together with a professional to help you get that confidence. You can either educate yourself or get a professional. And usually you should probably educate yourself and then have a professional look over your work, right? That's the best way. And that gives you confidence. One thing we've talked about before, retirement spending styles and how much of your retirement expenses are going to be covered with guaranteed monthly income. There's a lot of research out there that shows that people tend to have more confidence in spending that guaranteed income. If they know they've got a check coming in every month for the rest of their life, they're more willing to spend that money than just spending out of a portfolio. So, And that's no different if you think psychologically than if you have a really secure job with a company that has a culture where they rarely let people go and you have visibility that, hey, I'm going to be here for a while. It's much easier to spend money. Sure. Whereas if you have a commission job and it's always up and down and up and down, it's not near as easy. Same concept, right. right? And you know, the way you get that guaranteed income is maybe you defer your social security. So those payments will grow. If you have a pension, that's great. Maybe you look at some annuity income in there if you don't have much by way of pension or social security income. That's one way to get confidence. But I'm not really today wanting to talk so much about the financial side and how much you can spend. I want to talk about how you can improve your life by letting the reins go a little bit. So what do you do? Well, I hear club members in the Rock Retirement Club saying, you know, we have everything we want. We can't spend anymore. Don't want to spend any more money, even though we have a lot and we could. And I don't really accept that. I think any retiree can benefit from spending a little more money. For example, maybe you have one meal extra every month going out with friends or family members. Maybe you can improve your fitness routine by hiring a personal trainer. Everyone can have better workouts if they have a personal trainer. For any retiree, I'm thinking of this because I had some back pain recently. You can lessen that pain by either going to physical therapy or maybe it's getting regular massages. There's small amounts of money that you can spend that you can really improve your life and your lifestyle in retirement. And those are the kinds of things I'm talking about. Then you can look at things like lessen your risk of injury. Instead of getting up on the ladder and cleaning the leaves out of the gutter, maybe you start hiring someone to do that for you. I want to hit on that term, small amounts of money, right? Some people have very ample resources. Other people are more constrained. And I think it's important that it is relative, right? Let's take someone who is well overfunded for retirement. The idea of, say, hiring a nutritionist for $400, $500 a month to create meal plans and recipes and help with shopping. $500 a month to have somebody help you plan out food and give you recipes seems like a lot of money, even to somebody who has a lot of money. And in my mind, it is a lot of money to someone that is more modest or more normal. But if you have millions of dollars, $500 isn't that much money. But psychologically, we still sort of think it is. You're right. And it is all very relative to your means. And that's why we talked about starting with that financial plan. You have to know how much money you can spend. But the problem we're trying to solve today are people who have that money to spend, whatever it is for them, whether it's an extra $100 a month or an extra $5,000 a month. They have the money, but they just can't get themselves to spend it. And the reason I call it overcoming frugality is a lot of us who were big savers throughout our working lives denied ourselves certain luxuries or niceties of life because we wanted to be frugal, we wanted to save, we wanted to grow our money. That's the mindset that I think we need to get over in retirement because having an amount of money in retirement is no longer useful. Your money is for your lifestyle in retirement. And those are the kinds of things we're talking about. So a couple of tips, and these came from the Rodeo Roundup. So I wanted to share them with the, your listeners. And so we had, a and just so you, so those of you that are in the club, we had the Rodeo Roundup, which is a, we had over a hundred people in Fort Worth. And we had these little round tables where people could self-select and one of our teams simply led a conversation about a topic and Kevin led a topic, but there's probably 20 people at the table 
on overcoming frugality and sharing their journeys in that particular topic. So just so you understand what he's talking about. Thank you. And so three ideas that came out of that that I wanted to share today. And the first one is for my friend, Kevin Sebesta, Kevin Life in Fire, who's a coach in the club and a contributor in the club. But he talks about creating a bucket of fun money. In other words, set aside a certain amount of money that you're able to spend each month and require yourself to spend it on something that you enjoy. And it, you know, it's not sitting in your big investment accounts. It's just money that you have withdrawn and put into your checking account. And then you have to get down to zero every month. You make a deal with yourself to do it. And I think that's a good idea. I've, I've actually had a running joke with a couple of clients. I think I probably shared it before where I'm like, where they have this issue and we've done that. We've set money aside like this, Kevin. And I'm like, here, I'll solve it for you. You write me a check <laughs> for that amount. And whatever's in that amount on this day, I'm cashing it. <laughs> Nobody's taking like me up it. on that. I just want to collect all those checks and then just go look at it on that date and see. Some people have done that where it's like, I've heard coaches that will do it where if one is, you know, a rabid uh, Ohio State fan that the check's made out to the Michigan alumni football program or whatever. <laughs> that would be a big bet, Roger. You'd spend that money, no doubt. <laughs> I would hate to write that check. It would be very painful to write that check. I would definitely spend my money. So two other ideas, and, and I really like these. And one is I want you to create a list of, let's just say, three annoyances or or jobs you don't enjoy doing, things that if you never have to do them again, you'll be just fine with it. And see if money can eliminate those things. In our conversations, people talked about, if I never have to cut grass again, that'll be great. Or if I never have to wash the windows again or clean the house or clean the toilet. And so with those kinds of things, if you think about it, how much money would it take you on a monthly basis to eliminate those things from your life? If you don't have a very big yard, it's probably $30, $40 a week for, you know, I'm in, a, in Ohio in the summer. So it's just, you just cut grass for about six months a year. What does that come to? Maybe $1,500, $2,000. It's not a lot of money. And yet, if that's something that you just hate to do and every week, oh gosh, I've got to go cut the grass and you hate it. I happen to like it, by the way, so that wouldn't be on my list, but it was on some people's list. If you just think about that and then price it out and see if that will work into your budget and you'll eliminate those annoyances in life. What would that be for you, Roger, if you, you never have to do it again? Oh my, I never had to do it again. I can't think of one. I can't think of one. We like we don't have a house cleaner. We do have somebody mow the lawn. But Shauna does the pool. She enjoys all of that. What do I? What don't I enjoy? Some other ideas that people came up with along the line is you know I hate to drag my golf clubs through the airport or skis through the airport. Well, you know there are services that will ship them, and so they're available right at the slopes or right at the golf course when you arrive. So you never have to pick them up. So there are even things like that that just really frustrate you. If you think about those things, it usually is not going to cost you a lot because how many golf trips do you go on a year? You know, maybe three. <laughs> so you're talking a few hundred dollars. You never have to drag your golf clubs through the airport again. And a lot of this is a journey, right? A lot of this is you don't solve it. It's just slowly examining decisions that you make, like schlepping the golf clubs, as an example, or examining things that you've just taken for granted you always have to do. It's just, it's that awareness and then addressing them rather than just keep on doing it. Yeah. And the next idea, as you might imagine, is then choose three niceties or indulgences you probably consider or luxuries even that Boy, this would really add value to my life. I, I really can answer this it. one. This one, I, I have no problem. Anyone with. can answer it, right? <laughs> and we got massages. You know, I want a weekly massage because I'm stressed out at the end of the week. We got some people wanted to help someone, wanted to help a stranger once a month. You know, find a stranger who needs something and provide it for them. There are lots of ways. I mean, it's the list is endless. And we all have these things that, you know, maybe it's, 
I have always flown coach. I've never spent the extra $400 to upgrade to first class. Well, again, how many times a year do you fly? It probably doesn't cost that much to do it. Again, it's all relative, the expenses, but that's what I'm talking about is just figuring out if I added this to my lifestyle, to my retirement lifestyle, I'd be much happier and figure out if you can afford it. And that could be literally flying first class or depending on your means, it could be buying a cookbook or it doesn't have to be, it's all relative to your means. So you can do this regardless of where you're at on the wealth level or on the wealth scale. Exactly. And it doesn't have to cost anything at all. It may be, I'm going to spend one afternoon a week with a grandchild. And we're going to get together and we're going to go have ice cream or we're going to go to an amusement park or we're going to do something like that. It doesn't have to cost a lot. But if you think about what some of your other goals in retirement might be, I talked about helping someone in need. Maybe it's hiring a personal trainer we talked about earlier. It's things like that that you have never spent the money on. But now that you have accumulated the money and you've got new phase of life you're going into, think about what new expenses could you add to that lifestyle without spending too much. Again, we're talking about spending within your means here, but how can you improve your life? And I think you're only limited by your own imagination as to how great you can make your retirement lifestyle. And the cool thing about these things that I think can give you some comfort, because we talked about, you definitely want to have a plan of record and some framework for reevaluation consistently because life changes and the world changes. All of these things that you're talking about are discretionary. You're not obligating yourself for the rest of your life, right? As an example, if you have somebody clean the house, you can always stop. You're not signing up for a journey that you're going to be obligated to, so you can always switch later on. So it gives you flexibility, which optionality, which is always important. That's right. And you may find out you don't like whatever the thing is as much as you thought you would. Right. You know, sitting in first class might not be your cup of tea. Maybe you don't need the extra leg room. Maybe you don't like the warm towels, but at least try it out for a while and see that's what our money's for in retirement. Yeah. Someone in the club that I forget who it was that framed it this way. And it's so obvious when they said it was, Every dollar you have in savings is essentially income that you just deferred taking. And in retirement, you're just taking the income that you've already earned. And I like that frame. Obviously, there's growth and everything else. So it's not like it's it was deferred for a purpose. And this is some of the stuff we're talking about. Right. And I just want people to use their imaginations to make their retirement life what they want it to be instead of just funding whatever lifestyle they take into retirement. And I think that opens up a lot of possibilities. Amen. That's how you rock retirement. And with that, let's go set a smart sprint. On your marks, get set. And we're off to set a little baby step you can take in the next seven days to not just rock retirement, but rock life, right? So I want you to start to think about this concept of overcoming frugality And look for ways to enhance your life today in a way that you can feel comfortable that you're not sacrificing the future. That could be a small little thing you spend money on. Maybe it's washing your car, taking it someplace and getting it detailed once a month. It could be renting the house for all the family to fly them in. It doesn't have to be extreme. But the point here, as we play this ultimate game of creating a great life, is to make sure we're living life today and still having confidence about tomorrow. And sometimes we can get a little bit too far one direction. So I want you to think about that today. Excited about December. I hope you're excited about the holiday season. I hope that you're taking a little bit of time for yourself. And I look forward to chatting with you next week. Be well. Hey, it's time for that all important disclaimer. We so appreciate you listening to the show and love your questions and love the teaching that we're able to provide here. And actually it helps us too. But remember, you're not our clients. Not love it if you took advice from us. 
We would not love it if you took advice from us on the show. Realize this is helpful in some education. Talk to your legal advisor, your tax advisor, or your financial advisor before you make any decisions. We appreciate you joining us today for this episode of Retirement Answer Man. Be sure to visit rogerwhitney.com slash answers to access the Retirement Answer Library with over 30 checklists to help you make the most of the only life you have. Remember, you have more power than you realize to create an amazing life starting today with Retirement Answer Man. The opinions voiced in this material are for general information only and are not intended to provide specific advice or recommendations for any individual. All performance reference is historical and no guarantee of future results. All indices are unmanaged and may not be invested into directly. Have a wonderful day.